When you look at a market, you can tell, oh, Roy's probably making a lot of money on this day, or Roy's probably making a lot of money in this month. And all of my clients eventually develop that, even though they have no idea exactly what's in my strategy. Maybe even more so than with Trendfell, which sounds incongruous, but it is nevertheless the case. And once you get that idea for short-term trading, then it becomes very easy to keep in a portfolio. And I think what the burden of short-term managers is to provide clients that comfort. And it is a, it's a higher bar than just, oh, stocks are up, so we're long stocks. That's so we made money because we're long. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Top Traders on Plot, where today Alan Dunn and I are joined by Roy Niederhofer, founder and president of RG Niederhofer Capital Management, as part of our mini-series focusing on the one investment strategy that beat everything else in 2022, namely trend following, short-term trading, and managed futures more broadly. First off, Roy, it's great to have you back on the podcast after all these years. Thanks so much for joining us today. We really have been looking forward to our conversation and I hope you're doing well today. Thanks. It's great to be here again. Good stuff. Now, before we dive into all the topics that we have lined up that we would love to discuss with you, um, I would like maybe if we could set the stage for the conversation so that the audience knows a little bit about your firm's background. So perhaps you could share just a few highlights about the type of strategy you focus on and kind of where the business stands today as we've entered 2023. Sure. Well, uh, it's, it's hard to believe, but this is our 30th year of doing business. We, uh, as you probably know, we're one of the pioneers of short-term trading back in the early 90s. And currently we're managing about a billion and things are looking quite good for us, I guess, right now. We've had several great years in a row since, uh, since COVID, especially volatility has been quite high, which is our favorite kind of environment. So we've had four consecutive great years. And things are, uh, I think, very good for the space in general, for trend following, for our kind of short-term, primarily contrarian trading. Things are looking good. And I think in general, there's an, a new appreciation for macro that I haven't seen in a long time. So perhaps we're seeing a, a rare confluence of uh, performance for the space and performance for the overall CTA community and performance for short-term trading on our own that will be uh, quite, quite positive for quite some time. So uh, it's, a, it's an optimistic time. Indeed it is, and, and, and we certainly share your, your optimism, Roy. Now, you know, our conversation today for Alan and I have created kind of a list of different topics, and we kind of alternate a little bit in terms of who takes the lead on each. So what we normally do is we, uh, we let uh, Alan kick it off. Um, so Alan, uh, where are we starting off today? Thanks, Niels. Uh, hi, Roy. Good, good to speak to you. Um, yeah, it'd be great to kick off and get a sense on, I suppose, why um, your firm and, and and you chose to focus very specifically on short-term trading. Um, uh, uh, you know, is that from a, the perspective of a particular investment philosophy, or or why? Particularly from the perspective of a lot of the managers we speak to are more focused on medium-term trend following. I'm curious to to why you ended up focused on very short-term trading. There are a few reasons for that. I, I, part of the reason is my original background was in neuroscience. And I, I had the ideas after a, a few years of trading that I could start to quantify some of the insights that I'd encountered on human behavior and that seemed to be quite universal. And so I, I had the idea to unify the, the 
ideas of, say, Danny Kahneman and in general, the, the overall uh, hypothesis that the structure of the human brain influenced our behavior in predictable ways and that one could quantify the impact of those behavior patterns and find it in historical price data. And that this would then be an explanation for the very, very interesting patterns of non-randomness that I was encountering when I was working for my brother in the first five years of my career from 87 to 92 after I graduated university. My brother had spent already since uh, 1979 quite a bit of time and effort analyzing short-term price patterns. So he had already shown me that these things were there. And I guess what I did was try to find some explanations for why these patterns existed and then try to develop a overarching philosophy for where one should look to find more of these patterns. And that really helped me. Um, I, I like to use the analogy. It's like uh, the way uh, when Kepler uh, came up with the idea that the planets moved in elliptical orbits, it allowed the prediction of where another planet should be. And they actually discovered a planet based on the theory. Or when you're drilling for oil, if you have an idea where 200 million years ago there was a river, and if you drill along that river, you'll know exactly where to drill your wells. So you don't just drill in some random pattern. So it, help, it helps us find things. So that was one reason. And another reason was a business reason. When I started in uh, October of 92, when I left my brothers and began coding to write the software for Arjun Niederhofer, it was basically a world of trend followers. There was a lot of the turtles that were there, many of whom were still around and are still doing great. Um, and there wasn't much that was an alternative to that. And I realized that what we could do would be negatively correlated to equities in probably a different way than trend following would. So there was a business reason too. We would be distinct and also it would be methodologically interesting. So those were the two reasons. Interesting. And you mentioned working with, with your brother, uh, Victor, and uh, you know we've talked to other short-term managers who have uh, referenced their initial experience uh, there too. So obviously, I guess he was something of a pioneer in the space in terms of short-term trading. I mean, you, you said you kind of took your experience in, in neuroscience and, and that was a way of helping you explain some of these patterns that you were observing. So do you think that that kind of behavioral element, the opportunity that you're, you're, you're capitalizing on, is that still primarily just those the, the behavioral um, biases or characteristics of traders or, or is it a broader set of inefficiencies that you're trying to uh, capitalize on now? I would say both. Um, I, I, I would say we are, we are specifically looking for things that create um, strong emotional responses in market participants. And those are going to, if you, if you then look for those that will point you in a different direction than things that say require tremendous complicated computations, let's say, but might not provoke a strong emotional reaction. My view is that if you're going to feel something very strongly, that will make your subsequent behavior more predictable. And I think that's true in general in human behavior, and it's true in behavior of traders. And that's always been where we begin to look for uh, for for uh, predictable patterns that we follow. So th there's that piece of it. And I, I would also say more generally, one thing I think we've done very well is approach the problem of finding strategies in a highly scientific way to really think of this as proper science and not explaining data and not letting computers just squeeze the data until and torture it until it confesses spurious correlations and non non meaningful non causal relationships that seem to work historically and then don't generalize and fail to predict in real time. And you mentioned being in business um, thirty years now, which is is quite an achievement. Um, and you, obviously, you've seen a lot in those 
30 years, so many ups and downs. And, and, and I guess short-term trading has had ups and downs in, in, in that period too. You know, even in the last kind of 15, 20 years, we've had a couple of periods, a couple of lengthy drawdowns. I mean, is that just part and parcel of, 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 of these strategies? You would think if these biases are, are prevalent in markets, um, should they be more persistent? Or is it that these biases and these opportunities are more to the fore in, in particular market environments and, and when volatility picks up? I, I think there's definitely overall a correlation to realize volatility in all short-term trading approaches in that the market's got to move enough so that you can overcome your trading costs. And unless you're just selling volatility in the options market, it's going to be very difficult to make money if the market is flatlining and not moving at all. And certainly, the, I don't think anyone in the short-term space really appreciated how, how much the central banks were going to crush realized volatility with QE and, and then all the different versions of it that, that transpired later. And so what was a normal cycle of high to low and cyclical volatility that persisted until 2009, that became just a, a almost a, a falling tide of volatility, like a California drought that just went on and on and on and on until 2019 with a couple of, you know, maybe 13 to 15, there are some good trends in there and an occasional burst in 18. I can point to a few examples that I remember well, but basically from especially 17 and 19, I think it got to the point where a lot of people just gave up on short-term trading. And I think one of the, one of the great fallacies is to believe that there are no behavioral biases in systematic trading. You know, one of the questions I get is, you know, how if so many people are doing quantitative trading and and everyone's automated and everyone's systematic, how can there be behavioral biases? Well, one of the behavioral biases is it's hard to continue to do systematic strategies that aren't performing as well as other things in your portfolio. Seventeen and nineteen, all you wanted to be was short vol and long equities, and a lot of people gave up on their negatively correlated strategies such as trend following and such as short-term trading. And boy, was that a mistake in, as the last three or four years has demonstrated. And unfortunately, many of the people in short-term space were not even there to survive. We didn't survive 19 and 17 and weren't there to participate, which is really a shame because there was, there were so many good strategies that could have made money and many investors did, were not able to hold on to them for that great run from 20 and onward. Yeah, I want to dig into a little bit about kind of how investors look at these strategies. But before I do, based on what you just uh, mentioned here, Roy, I'm I'm curious, what made you believe in it or, and continue to believe in it? Because as you said, it was such an unprecedented long period of challenges for short-term uh, trading. Um, so what made you think that at some, some day this was going to change? That's an interesting question. Um, I guess I have tremendous confidence in seeing decades of the, of, of the models succeeding. And I also believe that people don't change. And I suppose having a, a core philosophy that says, well, this is really built into the human brain and it shouldn't change and that it is an exogenous force that's causing it is different from saying, well, you kind of blow with the wind and whatever the market's doing, well, that's the new reality. If you have a philosophy that you believe in and you have a reason for sticking with that philosophy, it does give you the strength perhaps to continue to follow it. And so maybe we were a little stronger and not change and not feeling the need to change. Um, so that that could have been it. It also could have been that we got lucky. You know, I don't want to attribute great skill to what could have been just me being stubborn or, you know, not coming up with an idea to do something else. Whereas you know, other people might have said, "Well, I should maybe buy a baseball team or something else." And 
So I, I think one of the, what, one thing that's very, very, uh, I, I've learned not to do is attribute great skill or intelligence to decisions that also were involved. There was a lot of uh, luck involved. A lot of people like to give advice ex post facto and say, you know, I was so clever back in the day. No, a lot of it's just luck and um, people that are humble enough to admit that. And and it may have been that I was just lucky to stay with it one, one year long enough to participate. So it could have been that too. No, I appreciate that. Now, you 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 mentioned this thing about uh, investors' ability to hold on to a strategy, and and I've referenced a paper that uh, Cliff Asnes and and our friends over at AQR wrote uh, last year, which talked about you know different things pertaining to to trend following in particular, but also um, kind of what uh, investors want. And I don't want what I'm going to say now to suggest that that's exactly what they wrote in the paper, but it it kind of leads to the question, um, because I think one of the questions they raised is, you know, are managers becoming too concerned about the shop? Um, but but the real question, I guess, is whose shop should we be concerned about? Is it the shop of the manager, uh, which, of course, a lot of investors will focus on that? Or is, the, is it the shop ratio of the overall portfolio of the client after they include these strategies, which arguably should be what investors should be concerned about. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about this and how you take this into account or not in designing your own strategy. Sure. Well, I I think perhaps uh, to a fault, maybe more than almost anyone else out there, I have been a hedge fund that actually hedges. You know, if I were to go back to my 26-year-old self and give 26-year-old Roy some advice, I would have said, you know where it says start a hedge fund? Don't listen to that word. Just be correlated to the S and P like everybody else. And you know, we ended up with a strategy that for twenty five years, I just have the number is we ran a minus point four beta to stocks and a minus point six beta to bonds, which meant that we have like I think the number is a nine percent annualized alpha for twenty twenty five years. Very few hedge funds have produced nine percent of annualized alpha to stocks and bonds each for 25 years. That's a tremendous track record. The problem is I did it with this negative beta. So it became very hard for investors who weren't able to look at it on a portfolio basis, which is what I thought they would do. I kept telling people when they'd invest, you have to look at this on a portfolio basis, but that's not what they do. One of the questions I like to ask people is, what's the sharp ratio of your health insurance? And they think for a second and they come back with, well, it's like minus infinity. So what does your investment committee think about your health insurance as a standalone investment? And, you know, from an investment committee perspective, it's possibly the worst investment you'll ever make. And you should immediately redeem from your health insurance and your fire insurance and your car insurance. And yet everyone has them. And we never even think twice about it. One of the greatest experiences and most fulfilling experiences I've had in my career was getting to work with a great idol of mine, Danny Kahneman, who I first encountered in university as you know, as a, an iconic figure in, in in academia. But we actually got to work together in a, on a paper that a presentation that we did at a hedge fund conference a few years ago on this exact topic. Why is it so hard for investors to maintain negatively correlated and protective strategies like CTAs in a portfolio. And as part of that, we did some some simulations and we came up with a really interesting hypothesis that if you have a portfolio of 20 funds in your allocation and 19 are hedge funds and one is a CTA, and they all have the same sharp ratio. So everybody's got the same sharp but they have different correlation. 19 are correlated to stocks in the way that hedge funds are, and one is correlated to negatively correlated to stocks in the way that CTAs are. It turns out that the CTA appears at the bottom of the monthly sorted performance table four times as often as any other manager. 
even though everybody has the same Sharpe ratio. And it was our view that this created a situation where the CTA gets far more attention for losing money than anyone else. And of course, because of loss aversion and recency bias and all the different behavioral biases that Danny identifies so, so beautifully in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which I think is the best book on trading ever written, by the way, they tend not to make it year after year in an allocation. They get redeemed. However, in terms of portfolio benefit, they're the most beneficial. And it turns out that even if the CTA has doubled the sharp ratio of all the other managers, they still are at the bottom more than anybody else. So it's really a problem, and it has to do with the skew of the strategy. Negative, negative skew strategies are much easier to have in a portfolio than positive skew strategies like CTAs. People love negative skew strategies because they all lose together. And one of the other ideas that we came up with was um, based on the idea of uh, Danny Gilbert, um, who is at... Um, he used to give the most popular course at Harvard, and he has an interesting idea. He calls it the emotional immune system. And his idea is that tragic events or really extraordinary events that happen to you in life tend to trigger a mechanism where you never give them as much tragedy or as much, ben uh, as much happiness in your experience as they really have. So they're muted. Whereas small events that are negative or positive are considered, are, do have the full value. So, it, so he says, well, the way to be happy is to have many, many small bursts of happiness. And so if you think about negative skew strategies, they give you many, many small bursts of happiness and then they crush you all at the same time, like the GFC. Everybody lost together, but we all kind of forget about the GFC. That, you know, so many funds all lost together. and But everybody kind of forgot about it. But it was horrible. And CTAs are the opposite. They give you periods of time where they just lose a little bit and lose a little bit, and they're, we, we can really irk you. It's like the, I, I always used it's like you're in a relationship and your spouse leaves their towel on the floor over and over and it just irks you. It makes you so upset and you can't stand it anymore. And uh, it just makes you so mad. And then they save your child out of the burning building. But are you still married to them by the time they have the chance to do that? And that's kind of like CTAs. Now, I need to take you back in time because, as I mentioned, you were uh, on the podcast for the first time back in 2014. Obviously, very different environment, uh, very different time. So I had to go back in the archive a little bit to, uh, to, to look, what did we talk about back then? And I was really, I was reminded about something that actually I struggle with a lot. And, and, and it was thanks to a paper you had written, because obviously I'm a trend follower, longer term trend follower. And, and you wrote this paper where, and I hope you don't mind me quoting from our conversation, but essentially you wrote a paper that suggested, or it was, it certainly raised a big debate about short term strategies versus trend. And also the role that bonds had played in trend following returns. And so um, the quote that I found was something like, so, and so this is you speaking, not me. Um, so this is a real problem because instead of having this beautiful smooth uptrend where you have the decline in interest rates and the roll yield all going in the same direction, if you're short, you've got the direction of interest rates correct, so the contract wants to go down, but the problem is the roll yield forces the contract to actually go up. This destroys trend. You can't trend follow in fixed income on the short side. It just doesn't work. So now you have the question, well, if two-thirds or one-half or whatever the number is of profits of fixed, um, of fixed income from CTAs came from being long fixed income, and now it's going not uh, it's not going to work. What uh, well, what is going to work? So, of course, there was no comeback to your argument back then because we had not been in an environment where fixed income markets had had real downtrends. But we have now tried that for a couple of years. 
has did it surprise you how well trend following performed in a rising yield environment based on the research you had done where you had actually i think tried to reverse the data on bonds to get to to your uh, conclusion did it surprise you how well trend did uh in in sort of once yield started to rise well there there really been a couple of a couple of tests of that um the the first one was believe it or not a very the, the fourth largest rally in rates was from march 10th of 20 to march 19th of 20 you probably didn't realize that but in fact that was a 9% decline in the Barclays Global Ag tr- Total Return Index. And it was the fourth largest ever, but it came on the heels of the massive COVID rally. And it was not a particularly good time for CTA. So there's no zero, a slightly down performance. It came after a big uptrend. So I, I wouldn't say that that was a good example of CTAs making money, but the big one was from January 26, 22, to June 22, where that index went down 14% and CTAs made 26%. So I would say I was completely and a hundred percent wrong on that particular rally. So the one big test of my idea was not successful. And there was another decline of 7% um, from August 2nd of 22 to September 20th of 22 of 7%. That's the sixth largest decline. And CTAs also had a pretty good run. Now, so far, I would say that the evidence suggests that my idea was incorrect. Now, I don't know whether my theory is going to be true overall, because what I didn't postulate was an inverted yield curve environment, right? Because what I was suggesting was that in the yield curve is positively sloping 97% of the time, or it had been until 2020. And in an inverted yield curve environment, however, to be short, you're actually getting paid to be short. And that's what we've had for the last few years. So we've had the longest period of inverted yield curve in, you know, I, I think maybe ever. So in this situation, it's hard to say whether you know it really is a test. My view was that in a normal rising rate period where people have the, uh, the idea that the longer duration fixed income should be higher yield than the shorter duration fixed income, then it becomes very costly to be short and you have to pay the roll yield to be short. So that's kind of the environment that I was talking about. I guess I never anticipated that we would have both the roll yield and the short position paying you. So it's kind of the opposite of what we anticipated. I don't know if I... uh... No, no, I mean, that's fine. I was just curious uh, if this has sort of sparked uh, ideas. I think your your point is 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 well taken in a sense that that you you had not uh, put that into your assumptions that the yield curves can invert and 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 I guess they didn't invert really until 2022 uh, as far as I recall. But the other thing I was thinking is that when we think about, and this is kind of going off script a little bit, but I'm, I'm sure we can do that. And that is when you look at signals in general, and so you'd know this much better than I do, because we use back adjusted price series anyways, um, the signal strength will be impacted anyways to some extent by the roll yield, meaning that if it works against you, probably the signal won't be that strong. So your position size won't be that strong either. Uh, so maybe in a sense, there's a little bit of a, a an adjustment mechanism in the whole, the way we structure our models to to take into account that maybe not all environments are, are equal, so to speak, but you're right. If we get both, yeah, definitely we should be able to to make money. Right, well, that that was my point, that you that you wouldn't actually get sales because the, 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 mark, the income markets have a natural tendency when the, yield curve is positively sloping, they want to go up. So you wouldn't see the actual adjusted prices go down enough to give you a short position. Now this time they went, this literally is the fastest tightening ever. So they gave you the trend signal, despite let's say in 2020, 
I, I, I guess not in 2020 so much, but in 22, whatever the yield curve would have done, it still would have been a downtrend. Um, you know, who, who knows what will happen in the future? So I, it may take 40 years for my theory to be tested or not. And uh, so we'll see. But so, well, hopefully we'll have, you, we'll have you back before. <laughs> is, uh, a big plus for the CTA side, for the trend following side, and a minus for RG Nieder Albert. So. <laughs> well, nobody's keeping score like yeah, that but, anyway. But most important, Alan, it's great for the industry. So everybody made money. We made money. The every, trend followers made money. So that's really good. <laughs> that is that is exactly the essence of it. Alan, where do we go next? Yeah, well, maybe, um, obviously, we're talking about trend uh, and we're talking about all of these strategies as, as, as a group. But also, I mean, you've, you've, you've mentioned on the role of CTAs in, in, a, in a broader portfolio and, 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 and the great diversifying qualities. And obviously, short-term strategies occupy, you know, a unique space there. In some senses, as you say, they tend to do well in rising volatility periods and um, they can do well in trend periods too and then they you know so so if you're an allocator looking at the the, the range of options that open to you you have trend short term but also you you also have tail risk type strategies and and, and option trading strategies and um, so i'm curious to get your perspective on where you think short-term trading fits vis-a-vis say volatility and tail risk uh, type trading and, and and why did you focus more on the on the um on the futures trading as opposed to options trading um in terms of executing that kind of uh the, the long long vol type uh, uh, um, exposure well i think that there's for for a lot of options strategies you want to get into those strategies when vol is low and when once the market starts to get volatile, it gets super expensive to enter those strategies. I imagine, you know, in say like, uh, I don't know, May of 2008, trying to buy a, a tail risk strategy, forget it. You, you know, you're talking about VIX of 40 or 50 or 60 by that point. There's, there's just no way you're going to do anything in the options market with premiums that expensive. No tail risk strategy. You, you know, you want to be short volatility at that point. Whereas a short term strategy that has the ability to trade futures can do even better. I mean, I think our sharp ratio from May to November was one of the highest that it's ever been. Versus, I can't imagine anybody made money being long options from May to October, May to November of that year. Um, in in, uh, in the tail risk strategy, so I think they're they're completely different and they have different uses. Um, I think the the duration of strategies from short term to long term are going to have dramatically different outcomes. I mean, look, this month is a perfect example. I think you know we have we had like a, I th- someone told me it was a twenty sigma drawdown in in the CTA index or something like that this month. And, you know, we're having one of our best months ever. And I think we're not alone. Some of the other short-term managers are up tremendously. Um, we're having a double-digit up month, and probably it's maybe the third worst month ever for the CTA index. And another month like June um, of last year, I think, was an, was similar, where you had a tremendous reversal off the, of the extreme. In that case, it was also fixed income coming up off the lows of the trend. And short-term strategy, strategies can get rapidly in the other direction and can have a real diversifying impact. And that can happen in equities, on the downside, whatever it is. So I think it, it's really important for people to have a diversity of duration in a CTA allocation and not think that trend following is just having five different, that, that diversification is not just having five different trend followers. Um, you know, that, there can be some diversification there based on allocation, but the reality is in a trend that's extreme, you're going to end up with all of your long-term trend followers fully invested at exactly the same time, maximally, as everybody was short fixed income at the end of February. And if the trend ends rapidly, everybody's going to lose at the same time. So there is that risk factor. And a lot of the short-term managers are able to be, and you know, in our case, we had actually proactively increase the amount of counter trend, knowing that there had been such an increase in trend following 
just on the basis of returns the prior year, trend followers had made 40%. So we said, well, wait a minute, the trend following, the trend reversals are going to be bigger. So we should really go the opposite way. Um, but that's kind of how we think. But I think every one of those strategies, short-term trend following, long vol, tail risk has its own benefit. Where we sit has been, we have really focused on the specific tail risk qualities that our fund produces. And in our case now, we are talking about being two-sided convex and both for stocks and for bonds. And we've been very explicit. We've always been really explicit about our tail risk qualities to a fault, I would say, um, more so than just about anyone else out there. And again, I would probably go back to my 26-year-old self and say, don't hedge. Like, you know, don't, don't, don't try to be negative 0.4 beta to stocks. I began investing in 1981 at a time when the stock market had, on a real basis, was down 50% in the last 10 years, and no one had made a dime in the stock market for the last 25 years. My grandfather, who had just died at age 90 or so, told me, never invest in the stock market. I got wiped out in 1929. He never bought a stock again for the rest of his life. And the short rate was 16.5%. The 30-year bond was 15.5% when I started investing. And then I started working for my brother in 1987. And six weeks later, the stock market went down 25% in a day. So I, I have like PTSD from inflation and the stock market going down. It's hard for me to get along the stock market. A lot of people never had those experiences, but I did. So, so from an asset allocation perspective, when you're in, engaging with investors, is that the message is that, okay, you're going to be adding some CTAs and invest in a diversified set of CTA strategies, not just trend, not just short term. Um, and there's a, there is a place uh, f f for each of them. Is is that your positioning? Yes, I, I think so. I, I think we what we've done a pretty good job of is being very explicit about the role that we play, why one should have us, that we have been clear about the correlation that we provide, the negative beta, the negative correlation. I think we're very clear about when we'll make money, about when we're not going to make money, and how to explain that. Part of the problem that people have with short-term trading is it's not as easy to explain as, oh, bonds have gone up for five months in a row, so I made money long being long bonds. It's a lot more complicated than that. So we have the, the added burden of each month, and you and I know this very well um, from talking about this for many years, explaining to the investors, why did we lose money? Why did we make money? How and where? And I've been pretty good at giving people heuristics, I think, so they can understand the types of environments such that, and, I, and you, you know this yourself, when you look at a market, you can tell, oh, Roy's probably making a lot of money on this day, or Roy's probably making a lot of money in this month. And all of my clients eventually develop that, even though they have no idea exactly what's in my strategy, maybe even more so than with trend following which sounds incongruous, but it is nevertheless the case. And once you get that idea for short-term trading, then it becomes very easy to keep in a portfolio. And I think what the burden of short-term managers is to provide clients that comfort. And it is a, it's a higher bar than just, oh, stocks are up, so we're long stocks. So we made money because we're long. Can I, can I, can I interrupt a little bit, uh, Roy? Because I, I feel I need to dig a little bit deeper. You point out uh, a couple of uh, situations and not we normally never discuss performance on our on the podcast but so these are just kind of concepts or ideas but you 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 point out a couple of uh, uh, periods where you say yeah uh, look at the what happened and trend followers got hurt etc cetera, etc cetera, because of these reversals and I fully appreciate that and and we we all know that. But there are also months like Volmageddon like November 2021, I think, where this was a big Omicron event. And I don't know what the short-term index did, generally speaking, but but I do know some managers got hurt during those periods. Can you help me understand a little bit then, how are these months different, <laughs> so to speak? Because there you have also big reversals and lots of volatility expansion 
how 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 are they different from from some of these other periods that you mentioned where things worked out really well for short term, not so much for trend? I, I there I guess it really depends on the particular strategy and also allocation. Um I don't you know, if you I, you know, I didn't want to sort of but I was just curious about it because we we I, I think Alan makes a, a, a good question about people wanting to diversify. So how should they think about these different things? And we we kind of know the weakness of trend following. We definitely know that it's it's as you rightly say, if bonds have been up for five months, we're probably long, and if there's a reversal, we're going to lose money. Shorter term strategies are much harder to. I guess they have less of a. Well, you say your clients will know on a good day or a bad day of, of what you're doing, but I find it really hard to predict uh, myself actually uh, if it's going to be a good month yeah, or a bad well, I month. Yeah, I think you have to be very careful what to ascertain what the drivers are of each strategy. Uh, there, even within the short term space, there are people who are doing five to ten day trading and people that are doing zero to two day trading, and there's an enormous difference in those two strategies. You know, there there are short term managers who are like 0.5 to 0.7 correlated to the CTA index, and others who are 0.2 to 0.3, like us. And that has to do with duration and the asset mix. Um, also, there are there are short term managers who are more long equity, long fixed income for various reasons and have it kind of gone in the multi strat ish or short vol direction, and others who are not. So so the, the, so those are some other factors and there so there you're going to get question that you're, you're going to see things like well if there's a massive trend reversal in fixed income okay well if it's a long-term trend reversal and the manager has a longer duration well i can predict that manager is going to do worse or if there's a long period of nothing if the market just flat lines well probably rg Niederhofer is going to have a tougher time than so and so other manager who's trading with a 10 day duration because they're not going to trade very much, whereas Roy might get chopped up a lot more. And, you know, they might be down 3% in euro, whereas the other manager might never trade because they're just holding one trade the entire time. Whereas my, I might trade five times in that same three week period where the euro traded the same price for three weeks. So understanding that gives one an insight, I think, into, into the strategies. There's just a lot more diversity in the short-term space I think. and you know there's yeah you just have to ask more detailed questions exactly no i think i appreciate that that's really helpful um, you mentioned this trade frequency and and one of the things we've certainly picked up from uh, a couple of the other short-term managers that uh, has been in this series but also actually some of the bigger uh longer-term managers is that they spend a lot of their research time. In fact, some of the biggest ones have said it's the biggest chunk of what they do in research is execution. Um, you got a, a good size of AUM. You are short term. You, uh, from from what I understand, you are probably one one of the more active ones. How do you think about and what have you learned over the years uh, in terms of of managing this part of of the strategy? So I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with that. I think it's a talking point. I think you can talk all day about execution and it's, I'm not saying it's not important, but I think it's a smaller piece. I think it's a percent. It's 2%. It's not 20%. And I think the, you know, if your strategy works, you should be able to execute it in kind of almost a, a naive way. And, and I'm not saying a stupid way. I'm saying if you're smart, you don't have to be too clever. You don't have to be ultra clever. And the difference between ultra clever and smart is not going to make or break your strategy. So that, that's my first piece of it. Um, and you know, the same thing like, I, I, I've always said that if your strategy doesn't show up in relatively, uh, it, you don't need like tick by tick data to do trades that are lasting weeks at a time. Like if you need that, you're probably overfitting. You're, if you're trading for weeks, it should show up in daily data. If you're trading for days, it should show up in hourly data. Maybe you can get a little bit more information from fire data than that. So 
that so that's my general view. I'm not saying execution isn't important, but it's not it's not going to make or break your trading strategy. Diversification is important. Trading size is important. Alpha is important. So that's where I think you know ha having a strategy that has a a one and a half sharp versus a negative point two sharp. That's important. The the difference is. An execution is going to be, you know, 1.3 versus 1.43 or something like that. No, I think that's a very valid point, uh, Roy. I, I uh, tend to agree with that. Okay, uh, with the, okay again, I'm talking about short-term trading here. You know, that's the, uh, you know, again, and there's lots of, and you can do it poorly. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, naive person's going to, going to have that. But as long as you're thoughtful, and maybe I'm just giving my, you know, I what I consider normal operating procedure might be, you know, the benefit of 30 years of experience and most people wouldn't think to do it the way we do it, but sure. that's the idea. <laughs> no, absolutely. And do you want to continue with the research? Yeah, well, you haven't even started on research, I think. Um, well, one thing okay, I wanted sorry. to talk about, which um, delves into a couple of these topics is, I guess, yeah, I mean, picking up on the point about the performance profile, um, you know, and and but 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 also the kind of the multi-strat nature of short-term trading being short-term momentum, but also contrarian, and also another topic which is machine learning, and it's it's obviously been a topic that's been very much to the fore recently. Uh, you know, in recent years, everybody's been very enthusiastic about what it can possibly bring, and and, and I think that's something that that Roy has incorporated into his um, portfolio. Um, so my question is, if you go back to maybe to talk about maybe the, the February 2018 type environment of Armageddon, which was a tough month for short term. Um, and, you know, so that's a month where, you know, as an outside investor, you might hope short term would do well. But but due to a various uh, set of factors, um, is a short term struggle. So how do you balance, you know, obviously, it's ultimately about balancing developing the best program with, 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 with absolute return, but being cognizant that, that with this multi-strat approach and, and incorporating things like machine learning, there will be months where you won't deliver maybe that, that kind of um, crisis alpha for, for, for want of a better expression. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I think that, <laughs> that, that was almost like an event risk uh, situation. Um, I, I think the nature of our world is which there there are always going to be exogenous periods, and it was it was certainly one you know I, I, you you wish you could, you wish you can go back and do it all over again. Um, you know, it turned out look it was it, it was the beginning of a burst of volatility, and you know it turned out it was an up quarter for us, but I, I think our worst month ever in the middle there. But it was a uh, I I I think me be a harbinger of what happened in 20 or, or right. Cause it was really the first time that they were starting to, uh, starting to think about reducing the balance. Sheet. Yeah. And when you get a month like that, I guess, okay. So more from a research perspective, um, does that just, uh, is that just obviously a, a, a negative point on the distribution or do you go away and say, okay, maybe we have something calibrated wrongly within the models um what's the process for thinking about that because i know this is something that you have done with your main program that you have kind of reassessed and reevaluated it um is that does that tend to be driven by performance or a macro view or your reading on how markets are trading um that well that month didn't change anything we're cer we certainly wouldn't want to make a change after that but my macro view changed with um the inflation and the clear understanding that we're going to have met unprecedented and, and completely uncontrolled debt to GDP, as far as the eye as, as far as the eye can see, and as a result, a central bank that is unable to bring interest rates to the level that they need to to control inflation, and therefore the risk of massive upside in financial assets. Now, for a guy that's been talking about downside protection for his whole career, as I have, maybe more than anybody out there, to start talking about, uh-oh, what about, 
you know, I'm not talking about Venezuela or Zimbabwe here in terms of that kind of appreciation, but, you know, what if we see 20 or 30% inflation because the U S decides that they're going to print money to, we're going to have a $51 trillion debt in eight years, the next administration, this isn't 40 years or 80 years from now, it's eight years from now, the next president, if it's a two-term president, $51 trillion. And that's just on the balance sheet, not the unfunded mandates of Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and veterans benefits, but just what's on the balance sheet. And if we're funding that at five or 6%, that's $3 trillion. What the heck are we going to do to fund that? And it means that we're going to have deficits as far as the eye can see, and it starts to become exponential. And my view is a risk factor that's never been there before is debasing the dollar, printing it to fund it. And that means we could have tremendous nominal appreciation in financial assets, not because stocks are so valuable, but because the dollar is becoming, is inflated. So in that case, the guy who's been talking about downside protection more than just about anybody, I have to start thinking about upside. And what about, how do I keep up with the S&P? And of course, this is a challenge for everyone in the hedge fund industry, because if you think about what you know, the, the HFRI hedge fund index, it's done a very good job of beating the S&P on a risk-adjusted basis, but not on a nominal basis, right? The uh, hedge funds in general, not individual hedge funds, but on a as-used basis, a, a portfolio of hedge funds as the way people use them have rarely out perform the S&P, but they have a much higher sharp ratio, which is great when there's no inflation. But if there's inflation, you know, if, if you didn't make, what, eight or 10% last year, you lost money on a real basis. And if you're going to make 10, if you're going to make half of the S&P's return and the S&P is going up and half of its return is because of inflation, well, now you're making zero. So my view is, People in our business, in the alternatives business, are going to have to keep up with the stock market in a way that they never did before. And that means you have to be willing to take fully invested and even leverage positions along the equity markets in a way that one never did before. You can't just take 70, you know, 130, 30 positions or whatever that is or, and, and, expect to, and, and expect to keep up in an inflationary world if what I'm saying is correct. But at the same time, I can make just as good a case for massive deflation. So my view is there's new risks out there and I have to be very careful not to get too, you know, too negative or too positive. And so that's the change that we made to our strategy to make sure that whatever tail we get in stocks and bonds, we're going to be just as good as we've always been on the left tail of stocks and bonds. Yeah. So I mean, that, that's obviously a, a, a research um, project driven by a by a macro view. Are, is that a kind of a different uh, strand of research to, to your normal day to day? Or uh, I mean, how do you, how are you unearthing new sources of alpha? On, on it's actually very easy for us. I mean, we we've spent so many years figuring out how to be consistently downside protective for stocks and bonds for our clients who have that exposure that it was it was almost trivial to do it. Okay. <laughs> And uh, as I say, in terms of the, the the types of strategies and insights you talked about at the outset, in terms of observing behavior, looking at new um, uh, trading strategies, un un unearthing sources of, of return, what, what's your main process for, for, for doing that? Is it from market observation, academic insights, combination of all of the above or, or what? So I've hired a couple of neuroscientists recently, people with actual field experience for the first time. Um, we have a, a number of people with more traditional quant finance backgrounds, and I've been hiring a little bit outside the, that, that, uh, uh, that path more recently. And um, so that's one, one aspect. But I think a lot of it is just market experience. We spend a lot of time watching the markets and everybody that works for me spends a lot of time in the trading room 
and running the strategy. There's not a separation between research and trading in my firm. And I think that's really, really important. My head trader, Paul, who's been with me since day one, was a former local on the COMEX and the NYMEX. And that experience really colors his, his management of the strategy. And, you know, the same thing with me. I mean, I've literally traded every day since 1987. So it, I, we think like traders, not like researchers. And I believe that this gives us a certain, I guess like a, you know, it's like, how, how can you do war strategy if you've never actually been in combat? Maybe that's the best way to put it. And I think it's very easy to think about strategy without understanding tactics and get it wrong. Maybe just one, one final one on this before we wrap up, just that we did talk a little bit about machine learning in that context um, of, of February 18. But in general, I mean, what has machine learning brought to the short-term trading space? Well, what does that those techniques uh, enable you to do? It's brought enormous risk and enormous ways of fitting data and a tremendous number of, of pie-in-the-sky strategies that are going to fail. So... I think you did an incredibly dangerous tool. And have you had success with it? We have had tremendous success with it, but not because we've let the computers analyze the data and find uh, features of the data. We think that is really, really dangerous. And the specific reason, and I'll just give you one example, that day with Powell, when uh, the text of the Fed announcement sent stocks soaring and a reporter asked Powell the question, you know, what do you think about the massive rally that's occurring in the stock market? And Powell looked at his quote machine, at the quotes and said, wait a minute, you shouldn't be taking that as a bullish signal. You, this should be extremely bearish. We're going to continue to tighten. And in five seconds, the stock market went down 4%. And that is not something that a machine learning feature creation uh, module is going to be able to figure out because it literally is a deus ex machina situation. And, you know, with you can't program that kind of thing. Even the weather is hard enough. That's a nonlinear dynamic system. And machine learning has a tough time with that. But we have like a nonlinear dynamic system that has... A, 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 an adjustment factor where it literally does the opposite <laughs> from an external force. And so convergence is a very tricky uh, situ tricky thing for a machine learning system when you have that factor. It's not like, you know, object recognition or speech recognition where you have basically linear discrimination between the two. When you're trying to decide a cup versus a bowl or something like that, you have a cup and a bowl and the and the border between them is hard. Here we have, you know, plus 4% to minus 4% thanks to Powell's whim on that particular day. And that makes it really hard. So I've, I've, I've been very, very, very bearish on machine learning for our domain, except for the next steps in the machine learning process, which are really, really useful. So the step one is very dangerous, but steps two through 10 are really good. So that's where we've had a lot of success. I have another question, um, another topic that I think is, is is relevant for all strategies, but maybe more so for the short-term space. I think the three of us all share an optimism uh, and certainly a strong belief and conviction that these strategies need to be part of any portfolio, right? And uh, maybe one day, maybe one day people will look at those who have fiduciary responsibility and say, well, hang on, have you got no exposure to these strategies? That's something we should talk about. But... In any event, what it may mean is that we perhaps will see some flows into our world, um, even though maybe last year people took a little bit off the table because they had to uh, fill a few holes elsewhere in their portfolio. But I wanted to ask you, Roy, a little bit about your view on capacity when it comes to shorter-term strategies uh, and maybe also liquidity of markets, whether you've seen changes, if, there, if, if you have any concerns and and so on and so forth well i think there's three three issues there which is you know should investors have the strategy 
and then capacity and liquidity. So let's try all three of those. Um, should investors have this strategy? I think this year and 20 really showed the value and just the, the incredible possibility of correlation between public markets, private markets, stocks, and bonds. I mean, if there was ever any demonstration, and look, we haven't even seen the private markets react. We haven't even seen the full impact on commercial real estate and all these markets. Everything is correlated. Everything. And in addition, as a, another first pass approximation, everything is short volatility to about a 0.9 approximation, except for a very small handful of strategies. Managed futures, and you could even say short-term trading, more even more so is long volatility. And so the, the, uh, the appropriate allocation to these strategies is, is far higher. And we are in a world right now where, as I said before, the central banks are constrained because of their inability to tighten the way they used to and ease because of the potential inflationary uh, impact. And therefore, these tails that they used to be able to bring in and create these cycles of mean reversion are no longer as thin as they were. So markets can really continue. And this is a tremendous case for trend following and for short-term trading, the causes of volatility are much greater than they've ever been before. So I think risks are abundant now, far more than they've ever been before. So that's our rationale for these this two-sided idea. And I think for, for other people, and, and I think, look, liquidity is something that people should be paying for right now. And you know, the idea of a, a REIT closing and suspending redemptions, the idea that you somehow are getting your, you know, the, these these private deals that people are so happy to be invested in because they're not marking on a on a monthly basis or a daily basis. But we have to mark, and then people say, "Well, CTAs are too volatile." I mean, it's just ridiculous. And to think that on on in March of 2020 that the average private deal was not down 85 or 90 percent in the middle of March, 2020, or on the lows of more recently. It's, of course they were, but they don't have to market. And the fact that CTAs were up or, or in these periods is just phenomenal. So do we belong in these strategy, in, in, in these portfolios? Yes, and a diversity across the space belongs in the strategy. It belongs in these portfolios. So the answer is unequivocally, yes, much more. But what about the capacity? What if what what if what I say is convincing and they say, okay, here's a trillion dollars, go. Like, oh, uh oh. <laughs> so so the answer is no. We that's it's it's a limited opportunity. And so, especially in the short term space, you have to manage your capacity. And so, you know, for us it's gonna be you know, three, four billion. That's about it for us at our current duration. Look, we'll find other things to you know, other ways of trading. And you know, obviously there's the multi-strat path for some managers. You can, you know, some, some have kind of gone in that direction successfully. Some have not gone in that direction successfully. You can always diversify in that, in that way. And of course, then you get more correlated to stocks. Maybe you can avoid that. Maybe you can avoid getting short volatility. So there are ways of managing growth that I think some have successfully achieved. Others have not. Um, trend following obviously has more capacity. But of course, then as a lot of people have discovered, it's very easy to just get long stocks and long bonds with predictable results if stocks and bonds go down together as they did more recently. So that's a pitfall. So um, it's, it's a trade-off to grow in that direction. And I think it's every manager has to address that question individually. And it's a question to ask each manager. In terms of liquidity, um, the, that's the final question you asked me. Interestingly, across the fixed income duration, it's it's very different. The short end has really changed. Um, two year went from thousands up to fifty to a hundred up in this banking crisis. It's really tough to execute. We don't trade that very much. The longer end, however, is um, just where it was. We have seen not much impact there, and I think the other markets have been very good. One thing to always take with a grain of salt is when people say, oh, well, the, the 
the amount on the bid and the amount on the offer has decreased. That's not the key metric. The key metric is relative to the volatility that you see in the market, how much does it cost to get in your position size that you want to take relative to how much volatility you're getting? That's the key metric, not just how much is there on the bid or offer. Sure, yeah, that's a metric, but for a typical manager, you want to take a position and then there's going to be some vol of that position. And can you get into that position? And then is it an appropriately sized position for the volatility? And is the question you want to ask, not just what this bid size is. Yeah, no, absolutely. Roy, we're coming up uh, on a little bit more than the hour. So I'd like to just finish off with one final question, which we've asked everyone uh, on the in the series so far. Um, in your case, I'm going to change the, the wording a little bit. You can answer both. But what we are trying to find out is what's the worst or the one thing that you've heard about short-term trading or trend following for that matter uh, that you disagree with the most? I think there's some misconceptions about short-term trading. One is it's trend following. It's definitely not trend following. Um, I think... So that's one. I think there's a tremendous amount of diversification to be had from trend following, especially if you're careful at picking it for some man for some short-term managers. A second one is there's a bleed that's like buying options. So a lot of people mistake when I say we're long volatility, they hear we're long premium, not we're long realized volatility. Okay. So that's another one. And I think a lot of people look at track records and they don't appreciate the ability for a manager to grow and change over time. So a lot of people don't fully get in, you know, they're looking back at, you know, track records from, you know, like, look at, look at your terrible performance in 2009. And they're not asking the right question, which is, How much of what you did in 2009 are you still doing in a systematic strategy? And the answer is probably like very little, but yet they're very, very focused on that. So they take a lot of, they take a lot, they put a lot of credence into actual track records of strategies that the manager threw out a decade ago or more. So that's, that's, I think, another misconception that people have that it's very important to get a sense for current strategies and the manager's research process and how much you believe the manager's bullshit versus their actual research process integrity versus their track record. Yeah. No, I think those were three very good points. I'm glad you mentioned uh, all of them. On this note, Roy, we're going to wrap up our fascinating conversation. Thank you ever so much for being on the podcast again, for sharing your thoughts and insights with us. We hope that we can do this again sometime in the future. And to all of you listening in today, I hope that you were able to take something from today's conversation onto your own investment journey. And if you did, please share these episodes with your friends and colleagues. From Alan and me, thanks so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you on the next episode of Top Traders Unblocked as we continue our deep dive into the CTA industry. And in the meantime, go check out the show notes for this episode and all the other resources you can find on our website. And of course, not least, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.